So let's summarize what we covered in Unit 2. Unit 2 was about generating fractals. And the main point, the main lesson is that there are lots of ways to generate fractals. So started by thinking about simple geometric rules. Take a line segment, replace it with a bent line segment, and then repeat, iterate. Take those line segments, replace them with bent line segments. So as we saw in the first unit, this is capable of producing fractals. If we add in a little bit of irregularity or asymmetry, so maybe it's not a um, isosceles triangle, it's, got a little, it, it's bent, wiggled off to the side, then we can get some more interesting shapes. And just experimenting with this and um, slightly more complex rules can give a pr pretty wide array of different fractals. So I mentioned a little bit that there are a couple different ways one can formalize these geometric systems. And one is known uh, uh, as uh, iterated function systems. So in an IFS, you have one or more geometric transformations. Usually you start with the shape and you sh shrink it, make a couple copies of it, and maybe twist those copies a little bit. And those transformations are usually represented with matrices, so then they're things you can start doing algebra with. And fractals very often result as the attractor of these systems. So you start with a shape, you do the IFS, do it many times, and that's a way to generate a fractal. Um, another bit of formalism for generating fractals is um, something known as Lindenmeyer systems or L systems. And these are algorithmic representations uh, of the process through which fractals are generated. And in particular, it's by a string rewriting system. So in the example that I gave, the string F was replaced with another string of symbols containing Fs and other things. And then that process is repeated again and again, and that can describe uh, the process through which a fractal is made. So both of these are sort of their own areas of mathematical study in their own right. A lot's been written about the mathematical properties of these systems, and people have experimented with these things a lot. So there's um, lots more to read and think about and do if you're so inclined. All right, so then, I said, um, instead of thinking about a deterministic system, let's think about a random system. So now the rule is take a line, replace it with a bent line up half the time, and half the time with a bent line down. And this change produces what I think are really interesting looking fractals, these random Koch curves that look a lot like coastlines perhaps, or maybe the ridge top of mountains. And if you generalize those ideas so that you're working not with lines, but with surfaces, and add a little bit of randomness and then a little bit of color, you can produce these fractal landscapes. So very simple iterated processes with some randomness and then of course with some color and shading can produce some alarmingly realistic uh, fractal images. These are sometimes known as fractal forgeries. So then I introduced the chaos game and that's another random system um, that produced the Sierpinski triangle. So the rule here was start with a point, go at random either halfway to A, halfway to B, or halfway to C. And that process produces a, a fractal, and related processes can produce <coughs> related fractals. Um, and we talked a little bit about how, how the chaos game works, where that fractal comes from. And then the last um, sort of class of models we looked at was diffusion-limited aggregation. And this is the most realistic of the models that we, um, that we treated. And so here we have, say, a single uh, nucleating particle in the center, and then other particles random walk, they move at random in, and when they um, hit this, they stick. And then a cluster, or an aggregate, forms. And they tend to have these long um, dendritic arms. And I uh, experimented a little bit with a piece of software that lets you do a similar thing. Here the aggregate is growing on a surface and the piece of software instead of around a single point. So, um, the main conclusion from all of this is there are many simple ways to make fractals. Both deterministic and random iterated processes lead to fractals. So fractals may look complex or complicated, but if you think about how they're built, they often um, can be built quite simply. These very simple rules that get repeated um, produce these very intricate fractals. And so I like to think of fractals as being, in a sense, a generic shape, and that there are many fairly simple ways to make them.
So I began this unit by commenting on the branch shape that was left behind after I picked elderberries off my elderberry bush. It's a striking shape, purple branches and this fine sort of lacy structure here. And we might be perhaps initially surprised. How is it that a dumb bush, a simple shrub, can make something that's so complicated? And what we've seen in this unit is that actually fractals are in a sense easy to make. There's lots of simple processes uh, that when repeated can produce these intricate sorts of fractals. So some of the fractal shapes we've been looking at, these dendritic structures that look like ferns or corals, snowflakes, branching patterns, uh, and so on, are in a sense generic. Generic in that there's lots of ways to make them. Invo uh, techniques involving both uh, deterministic processes and random processes. And it's inter interesting to me that we see these structures in both biological and in physical systems. So that, to me, gives further evidence that there's something in a sense fundamental or generic or just commonplace about these structures. We might think that biology is different, um, and for sure biology is different than physics, but we might think, well, this has this shape because it's evolutionarily advantageous. And that actually may indeed be the case. But natural selection tells us that if a variation appears, uh, the more advantageous one will be selected for. But it doesn't really tell us anything about the variations that might appear in the first place. It doesn't tell us about the palette of structures um, among which it can choose. And so I think what uh, the study of fractals shows is that there are certain shapes that are common, very easy to make, and so we shouldn't be surprised if we see them quite frequently across the natural and the physical world. So that brings us to the end of Unit 2, generating fractals, lots of ways to do it. In Unit 3, we'll return to the mathematical analysis and we'll look at the box counting dimension. This is a more flexible and more um, powerful and applicable notion of dimension that can be applied to many different shapes and to many different processes. So we'll see you next week.